Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and in this video, you're going to see an exclusive teardown of a new Canon RF lens and a peek into their latest optical technology and manufacturing. If you've ever been curious what goes on inside a modern lens, this is the video for you. Normally, camera companies can be quite secretive about their designs, and in 30 years of technical journalism, I've rarely had any official access to the actual manufacturing processes beyond occasional factory visits with anxious managers ensuring we don't look too closely. So when Canon reached out and asked if I'd be interested in filming one of their engineers disassemble a new lens in close-up detail and explain exactly what's behind their latest optical designs, I said, yes, please. Now this video isn't sponsored by Canon, it's just a rare opportunity to look behind the scenes which I thought would be interesting to anyone who's into lenses, regardless of the system that you use. So thanks to Canon for the invitation and let's get started. Our specimen today is the Canon RF 28mm f2.8 STM, a pancake lens announced in May 23 which uses some pretty interesting new types of optical elements to achieve its compact size and weight. All lenses start with a design brief, setting out not just the focal length and aperture, but also the target quality, the approximate size and weight, and of course the desired price point. For this model, Canon wanted to produce a compact and affordable pancake lens for the EOS R mirrorless system, and 28mm was chosen as it's a flexible focal length for stills photography and video on both full frame and cropped APS-C systems. Trouble is, though, the shorter back focus distance of mirrorless cameras compared to DSLRs presents an optical challenge for wide-angle lenses. If you don't do it right, you'll suffer from greater softening and darkening towards the corners. The diagram on the left shows the earlier EF 40mm f2.8 lens, designed for the longer flange distance of DSLRs. Notice the fairly shallow angle of the light ray as it strikes the extremes of the sensor. Now on the right, look what happens if you try to use the same optical formula for the shorter flange distance of a mirrorless camera. The angle of the light ray becomes larger, resulting in greater darkening and softness towards the corners. To reduce the angle at the extremes, you need a new optical design with some unconventional looking elements. Here's Canon's solution for the RF28, where a series of three large aspherical elements towards the rear of the lens work together to deliver much shallower light ray angles. The largest element of all at the rear is only possible thanks to the diameter of the RF mount. But proposing a design is only one half of the story. Now you need to actually make these unusual elements in practice, again while attempting to meet the target weight and price point. The RF28 2.8 design employs three aspherical elements, so called as their shape is not a section of a simple sphere or cylinder. Modern lenses often employ a spherical elements alongside more conventional spherical ones to reduce issues like spherical aberrations, but there's actually several ways to make them. Canon has four different ways of producing a spherical elements depending on the target quality, weight, price, and the actual complexity of the shape itself. A typical lens could include elements made using several of the following techniques. The first and most traditional option is to grind the shape. Canon typically grows fluorite crystals, then grinds them into the desired shape, which can produce very high quality results, but they're also heavy and expensive to make, so are generally reserved for their flagship L-series lenses. The second technique is replica aspherical, where a normal spherical element is bonded with a resin layer to give it an aspherical shape. Third and fourth, use moulding techniques to shape molten glass or plastic resin into the desired aspherical shape. These allow often complex shapes to be produced at a low cost, and thereby are a popular option in consumer lenses. Again, a final lens design could include a combination of elements made using these different techniques in order to meet the target brief. Of the four techniques, plastic moulded elements, or PMOs, may seem like a basic approach, but by injecting optical grade resin into a precision mould, then hardening it with UV light, you're able to easily make elements that wouldn't be possible with glass moulding, or prohibitively expensive with grinding techniques. Indeed, the RF28 2.8's three largest spherical elements are all produced using plastic moulding and allow it to not only meet the target price, weight and size, but also deliver higher quality results than you might expect. While PMOs are a fairly modern technique for producing elements, Canon's actually been using them in many of its lenses for some time now. In fact, most of the more affordable lenses in the RF lineup employ PMOs in their optical designs, including the 16 2.8, 15 to 30, 24 to 50, 24 to 105 STM, 24 to 240, 24 1.8, 
51.8 and 100-400, as well as the RFS lenses designed for cropped APS-C bodies. Going further back still, PMOs were also used in the EFM 18-55, 18-150 and 15-45, as well as the EFS 18-55 and 18-135, so they've actually been around for some time and most Canon owners have probably had at least one in their collections. In fact, PMO's first outing for Canon was in the Snappy 50 back in 1982. The use of plastic moulding also allows you to easily produce squared off rectangular shaped elements, allowing lens designers to not only reduce weight, but reclaim space occupied by redundant portions of a traditional circular element. Remember, your sensor and photos are rectangular, so technically there's no need for all the elements to be circular. Of course, you could also grind a glass or fluorite element into a rectangle, but it would add to the cost versus a moulded element where it's produced at the time of injection. So let's now see how all this theory is put into practice by disassembling the RF28 2.8 and seeing not just those unusually shaped elements, but how the space savings being put to use. The lens was taken apart by Shinsuke Ito from Canon, who guided me through each step and component. The entire process took roughly half an hour, but I've sped up sections here. Okay, so the first step is removing the lens mount. There's four screws to remove, after which you can prise the metal mount from the barrel. Note the diameter of the RF mount is what allows those large rear elements, which in turn provide greater flexibility in optical design. After popping out the central baffle section, you can remove the external decorative ring. Now you can see the main circuit board for the lens, along with the ribbon cable leading to the 12 pins which are used for communication with the camera body. The RF mount allows much faster data communications than the older EF mount, in turn enhancing things like focusing, aperture control and stabilisation, not to mention supporting additional controls. You can also see the shape of the circuit board is exploiting the space that's freed up by those rectangular lens elements, and that's partly what's allowing a more compact lens barrel. After unscrewing and removing the circuit board, it's possible to unscrew the external barrel. Due to the size of the lens, this is a fairly short cylindrical section, but it's home to the main switch, allowing you to select manual or autofocus, or assign the focusing ring to a custom control. Next is to remove the STM focusing motor itself, a tiny component that again slips into the space freed up by the rectangular lens elements. Accommodating focusing motors is a key challenge for lens designers, so the chance to exploit any spare space is welcome. Canon's used a gear type stepping motor here for size, smooth operation and fast response. Next, Shun prizes off the ring printed with the lens name and specs as seen from the front. And now for what Shun calls the fixed barrel, which surrounds much of the lens group which has become progressively exposed during the physical disassembly. The lens is then turned round to remove the filter barrel, held in place by three screws. As its name suggests, this is used to mount filters, and as a side note, it's interesting how on modern mirrorless lens designs, the larger elements are now often at the rear of the lens, leaving a relatively small one at the front, and that's the opposite to many DSLR lenses that we're used to. Next, the lens group is removed from the focus barrel, and as Shun turns this from the side, you'll see the helical grooves used to shift the required lenses while focusing. Now, finally, we can take apart the main lens group, starting with the protection glass, which represents group 6. Next comes group 5, which consists of a single, large, plastic-moulded, aspherical element. And from the reflections, you can see this is the one with the seagull profile, and again, notice its rectangular shape. Next, Shun removes the first of several tiny collars. These are adjusted on each lens to fine-tune their performance at the factory and ensure the optics are perfectly lined up. The first lens group can now be separated to reveal the electromagnetic diaphragm, or EMD for short. This is what adjusts the lens aperture, and while it's operated electronically by the camera in normal use, it's possible to demonstrate the opening and closing mechanism with the right tool. This iris on RF lenses can also be adjusted in very fine increments to minimise visible steps and exposure while filming video. After removing another adjustment collar, the section containing the second and third optical groups can be separated, and after peeling off a ring, you can see the third group, and this consists of another plastic moulded aspherical element. Note how this one is circular. This leaves one final group, and if you've been counting, you'll know it's group 4, again containing one plastic moulded aspherical element, and like group 5, it's a larger, more complex shape with squared off corners. This leaves the guide barrel as the last part of the disassembly process. 
Let's now take a closer look at the elements laid out in group order, starting with the outermost group, which consists of two glass elements. Next, here's group two, which also contains two glass elements. Now here's group three, which consists of one element, and it's the first of the three plastic molded or PMO aspherical elements. Next in group four is the second PMO, and notice how it's squared off. And after that, it's the rearmost fifth group containing another single PMO that's also rectangular in shape. These five groups of seven elements make up the main optical construction of the lens, but there's an additional covering element at the very rear representing a sixth group. Let's take a closer look at the three main plastic molded aspherical elements, and as Shun angles them to catch the light, you'll notice the reflections revealing their unusual shapes. In particular, the two squared off aspherical elements employ almost wing-like profiles, not dissimilar to, say, a seagull in flight, or perhaps an elaborate moustache. I love looking at reflections in lenses, and some of these remind me of the black hole in Interstellar. Anyway, it's these shapes that are allowing compact, wide-angle mirrorless lenses to deliver well-corrected results into the corners despite the short flange distance, and I believe Canon is one of the first companies to produce this kind of element for a mass-produced lens. And while you could in theory grind them out of fluorite or other elements, it again would be difficult, expensive, and in some cases completely impractical. Indeed, plastic moulding was primarily chosen here as the best way to achieve the actual complex shape, with the added benefits of being lighter and more affordable, while also providing the opportunity for squared off shapes. Canon's also making bold claims about the performance, with the RF28 2.8's MTF chart looking pretty respectable against the high-end RF2870 f2L zoom at 28mm, albeit open to f2. The RF28 2.8's MTF chart also compares favourably against Nikon's recent Z26 2.8, and while the dimensions and weight are similar, Canon's is also coming in cheaper. In my 30 years of reviewing camera gear, I've learned it's important to approach new materials, technologies, and techniques with an open mind, and the bottom line is while high-end lenses, like Canon's L-Series, will continue to grind fluorite elements for some time, plastic molded elements are allowing more compact and affordable designs that literally punch above their weight. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so I'll be thoroughly testing the RF28 2.8 as soon as I get hold of a reviewable sample to see if it lives up to expectations. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications so you don't miss out on that or any of my other in-depth reviews. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this technology backgrounder, and thanks again to Canon for the opportunity to peek behind the scenes of their latest lens designs, and of course Shun's expert skills at taking apart the lens. Now all I have to do is figure out how it all fits back together again. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.